Frankie is interesting because normal life, she has determined, is her trigger. Mm-hmm. Like, in many ways, Frankie's leading this anti-life because everything she's been told that we should want, you know, a stable job, a stable relationship, a house, a white picket fence, that's all the stuff that drives her to drink. Mm-hmm. But this kind of anti-life of owning nothing, of just going from town to town, but having this really overdeveloped sense of purpose. So at any given time, waking up at the first thing in the morning, she, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to find this person, I got to find the person, I got to find this person. That is kind of what's helping her cope. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks 2, where our guest today is Lisa Gardner, an author whose career I have followed for a very long time. In fact, I was trying to realize how many years, but you know, we haven't aged a moment. Last night, I was trying to remember, I was trying to figure out which book came first that I read of hers, and I couldn't do that either. So I do know that today we'll be talking about her latest novel, which is Before She Disappeared, latest thriller. And there's some very different things about this thriller from Lisa. So looking forward to hearing her. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Carol. Yes, I'm going with we have not aged a day and we knew each other yesterday. (laughs) I think I'll roll with that. Everyone, we're on record now. That's what we're saying. So I'm very excited for Before She Disappeared. It is my first standalone title in 20 years. I've been known for writing the Detective Judy Warren series, FBI Profile, or some other books like that. But for Before She Disappeared, I had the inspiration for a very unique character. Um, I had read an article about a real woman, Lisa Yellowbird Chase, who grew frustrated by the number of women who were going missing on tribal lands and just the lack of resources, but also the lack of interest Mm -hmm. to do anything about it. So she became personally involved. And this notion of an everyday person, you know, someone like you and me, no special background or training, actually getting personally involved in these missing person cold cases just captivated me. So that brings us to before she disappeared. We have Frankie Elkin. She is a recovering alcoholic, a woman, as she says, uh, short on belongings, long on regret. And this is what she does. She goes from town to town looking for the missing persons that the rest of the world has forgotten. And that brings her to the Mattapan neighborhood in Boston, also nicknamed Murder Pan by the locals, and that's for real. (laughs) A 15-year-old Haitian girl has been missing for 15 months. How does a teenager even disappear in the midst of a dense urban population where you have surveillance cameras, witnesses everywhere, where teenagers, we know they have the cell phone glued to them, social media leaving breadcrumbs everywhere? What happened to Angelique Bordeaux? And that becomes before she disappeared. Wow. So did you, okay, so you hear about this woman and then you start developing your character or developing the plot first? Which one ended up, which, where do you start? Well, it was kind of a fascinating process for me because one of the things, most of my books really do start generally with a crime, something ripped from the headlines. But in the case of reading this article about the woman, it really was the character. Because by the time you're done reading this, and it was an article on the BBC, you're kind of left with, who does this? I mean, what kind of person sells their house, all the worldly possessions, and takes on just this mission? And in particular, finding missing persons that have kind of fallen through the cracks, the underserved communities, poor neighborhoods, inner cities. That, I mean, if you go to the Black and Missing Foundation, it is staggering to me the number of cold cases of missing persons the rest of us have never even heard about Mm -hmm. So there is this real gap and it's very admirable to have someone step into it, but who does that? And that somewhat really is the kind of driving force behind Before She Disappeared. It is absolutely kind of a fun riddle, like how do you even disappear to get found? But it really is, who does this? And every place Frankie goes, that's the first question she gets. I mean, the police are like, really? You're a professional bartender and you're interfering with our investigation. And the family is like, really crazy white lady on our front porch we've never met who's going to magically bring our loved one home. I mean, the question she kind of keeps encountering from everyone is, who the hell are you? And what's your problem? (laughs) What's your problem? Why are you doing this? I know you love true crime as much as I do. Like just really 
watch, I mean, I remember reading, uh, you know, when I was younger, like these really scary books and I was, oh, wow. I just think this is so interesting and it's true crime. It's like, you know, this is what really happened in these places. Um, do you watch true, true crime shows as well? Because I know I'm like riveted to watching the series if they have something like that. Shows, podcasts, uh, one of my favorite uh, true crime authors and rule who sadly has passed away, but a huge influence on my career. And now Greg Olson is one of my favorite. He's now starting to write fiction thrillers as well, but a lot of his nonfiction books on true crime, just absolutely dazzling. Well, I remember I was going down the rabbit hole in the HBO series, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which was based on Michelle McNamara's book about the Golden State Killer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they had all these amateur sleuths, like these people yes. that would just say, I've got this information, I've got that. And they were in, like, the police were looking for this, but not really looking. And these people had all this data and what they'd pulled together. And I was thinking about this, you know, Frankie's alone, she's a lone wolf on, on doing this. Yeah. But there are so many people where this is what's happening. I was thinking of Lost Girls, which is the story of the prostitutes on the North, um, North Fork of uh, Suffolk County on Long Island. And another underserved population that yeah. everybody was just, oh, we'll, we'll write these people off. We'll write these people. Off. But I think that you bring in so many different aspects about the human spirit into this as well, because Frankie's damaged. She's got a lot of baggage going on, mm -hmm. but she cares. She absolutely cares. What was really fun to me about, you know, creating Frankie Elkin is just th this notion of, first of all, I've always written police procedurals. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a detective DD or an FBI profiler or someone to do all the cool police scenes. And the whole point of Before She Disappeared is the police came in, they ran all their cool forensics and did all their cool investigations. And 11 months later, they got nothing. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research with the police to figure out what would have been done. And then really it couldn't have worked. So that kind of makes the argument for Frankie. I mean, cause she can't do forensics. She is not a computer hacker. She has really no cool tricks up her sleeves. She is a professional bartender. And she would argue her superpower is listening. Mm -hmm. It's not being the police. It's going into neighborhoods and talking to real people as a person herself. Because it's so often in the cases with a lot of these situations, the community doesn't feel comfortable talking to the police. And so that becomes one of Frankie's advantage. But pretty much, she's a good listener. <laughs> she's got that bartender neck for just sitting yeah. and listening. <laughs> she has the bartender neck of anticipating too. You know how a bartender is, you're sitting at the bar and they're looking and they can see so-and-so is going to need a drink and they start moving that way down the bar. There's this way that you're watching the room. And I feel like wherever she is, she's watching the room in a different way. And she's just seeing things differently because she's seeing it from her role of making sure everyone's happy and everybody's taken care of. If you want to use fancy words, Frankie is an excellent at social engineering Ooh. and becoming immediately relatable to whatever audience she is, which is something else you see in hospitality and customer service, an ability to immediately kind of size up and relate to the person you're trying to assist or become comfortable for them. So Frankie has just kind of this way, it starts to frustrate and before she disappeared, the real detective, like seriously, you had five minutes with these people and you discovered the um, missing girl's sex life. I mean, really seriously? <laughs> and Frankie like, yeah, I don't know what questions you asked them, but I, <laughs> I, mean, I have no problems. <laughs> yeah, I just went for it. I wasn't looking for the answer. I was looking for the clues. That's what yeah. I feel like. He's looking for the clues that are going to get her to the answer. They're looking to find the person. They're trying to find this. She's trying to find where they might have gone and what might have happened by asking her questions. That's what I was feeling looking at her. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, her other cases have not really been fruitful. Like, you know, it's been a lot of like, you know, go down this road and whatever. What keeps her going? What keeps Frankie going? And that becomes an excellent question. When you talk to people again in the real world who do this kind of amateur sleuthing for missing persons cold cases. I mean, when you're talking about a case that's 11 months old, three years old, five years old, the chances are you're not going to find the person alive. You're going to get closure. You're going to get an answer to what happened. And Frankie does believe there's value in that. But at the opening before she disappeared, we also know she's getting burnt out. She's getting bogged down. Um, she is yet to find anyone alive. And that is really wearing on her. Mm. 
completely emotionally trying, completely trying. And she's a recovering alcoholic, which means that there's some damage to her character as well. There's some trials. Like, do you need to get to a meeting? Do you need to get to a meeting now? Do you need to what we did? Because ticking in the back of her head, I felt like throughout the book was, I want to drink. She wakes up, I want to drink. And yes. she forces that down all day long. Did you spend a lot of time talking to people who or know people who are alcoholic or whatever to figure out like, okay, what is that feeling like all day long? I wanted Frankie to be realistic. Even myself in the past, I've written about characters, Ray Connor from the FBI profiler books been probably the most famous where I'm saying she's an alcoholic, but we never really see her ever deal with her alcoholism. Not really. Um, And I feel often in fiction, you know, we kind of do these hard boiled characters, the cynical cop, and they clearly have a drinking problem, but again, you never really truly embrace it. I like Frankie because I think one of the things about before she disappeared is that it's gritty and real. Mm -hmm. Frankie's human. She has spent 10 years now as a recovering addict. She has fallen off the wagon. Recovery for her is an everyday process. She thinks about her meetings. She thinks about what she needs to do or not do. Like, what are her triggers? Frankie is interesting because normal life, she has determined, is her trigger. Mm -hmm. Like, in many ways, Frankie's leading this anti-life because everything she's been told that we should want, you know, a stable job, a stable relationship, a house, a white picket fence, that's all the stuff that drives her to drink. Mm -hmm. But this kind of anti-life, of owning nothing, of just going from town to town, but having this really overdeveloped sense of purpose. So at any given time, waking up at the first thing in the morning, she, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to find this person, I got to find the person, I got to find this person. That is kind of what's helping her cope. But I I like it. And I I loved how it kind of developed because this wasn't necessarily planned on my part. (laughs) That in many ways, it's Frankie's disease that makes her really good at what she does. She is obsessive and she's self-destructive, which is any addict. But if you're going to insert yourself in strangers' personal lives to find someone, being obsessive and a bit self-destructive are exactly the two skill sets you need. Also, by being a little bit broken, she yeah. can go in and relate to these people whose lives are broken right now. And that's what I really saw in her as well. When she goes in and talks to these people, it's not like I'm going to go home to my perfect life with my two children and my dog. And well, no, she's going back. And so as a result, she's feeling their pain. She's seeing their pain because she's living some version of it every day. And she's living this off the grid kind of a lifestyle with no connections. Like she's you, at any moment, you think she could walk. At any moment, she may, I felt like if I was her boss at the bar any day, I might expect her not to come in. And she's late a lot, but I think I'd be saying, I don't think she's going to be here today, you know? And I thought it was interesting that she works in a bar because she's got the temptation of the bottle behind her every single day. She's bringing this drink to somebody. So it's almost like she's playing with herself and testing herself every single day by her job. Was she always a bartender? Did you always see her as working in the bar? She needs a job that's transient and that you can go to town to town and still get employment. Because I mean, Frankie's living at the fringes. Like she doesn't have a smartphone. She can't afford it. You know, she's got a flip track phone, like the world's oldest technology. She doesn't have a laptop. In some of the neighborhoods she lives in, some of these communities she's going into, it was just something that would be stolen. Mm -hmm. So she's definitely living socioeconomically this life. And she needs something where you can go to town to town and pretty much instantly be employed. And bartender is it. It was very interesting talking to recovering alcoholics too. Some of them are like, some of them are like booze is a trigger. And some of them is like, I can watch other people drink and I can even have booze in the house and I'm okay. But this is my trigger or that's my trigger. Again, if you want to get into the depth, I mean, addiction has a lot of different faces. So Frankie's just one face of it. I'm not saying if you're an alcoholic, you should work in a bar. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and it maybe is also slightly her self-destructive streak as Mm -hmm. well (laughs) to tempt herself all day long to tempt herself all day long of what she's doing um she also remind read somewhere that she reminded someone of jack reacher's uh, jack reacher lee child jack reacher she shows up does her thing and then she moves on well i was really seeing that too because she has minimal possessions she's carrying them in a bag and she's out of there and like uh she's not sending postcards back or writing christmas cards to these people she's just moving on 
a book review that says um, she, Frankie is like Jack Reacher with the gift of gab. And I just thought that was the, <laughs> I get to do an event with, with Lee Child on Thursday night. And I just, I thought that was the funniest quote. <laughs> that is <laughs> absolutely she, perfect. That's no matter, absolutely. Though I would argue she does have a toothbrush. Okay. She does have a piece of luggage, but yes, somewhat similar, which we're all going back to that archetype of almost like the lone gunman, the, the Westerns where the stranger comes into town. Mm -hmm. and now they're going to solve everyone's problems while they're there. <laughs> but you also think about the guy who owns the bar. Like, he's there. This woman has come in. He doesn't really know her, yet she's opening up, closing. She's staying upstairs. She does have that cat that we're going to get into in a second, but, you know, she does have that cat that's like the attack cat. But will readers see Frankie again? Like, because I love this character. Does she become the new oh, series yeah. character? So this is the irony. I keep not planning on writing series, but writing series. So Dee Dee Warren was never supposed to be a series character. She was actually supposed to be one chapter for a book where I needed a Boston cop. Flora Dane, who showed up as a, you know, victim turned vigilante, find her, that was supposed to be her book. But she kind of has come back for four more. So Frankie is my big standalone in 20 years. And yeah, I'm writing the new Frankie now. There's, it's absolutely going to be a series. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need a 12 step program for that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was looking back and I was like, wait a second, this is the first standalone. I was going back, I was going through your website last night and I was, wait a second, this is the first one in a really long time. And, but I didn't have a funny feeling. I, the character is too well developed. She's too good. And also, she's had success. And I think that that success is going to fuel her going on too. And I think she's just interesting mm -hmm. with her flaws and she's haunting. You see this woman who's so broken, but so actively working on her recovery. Like, I'm going to be a real person. I can't be a real person the way you guys are real people. So I'm trying to be a real person for me. But her own kind of embracing of, I really am a hot mess, but I am trying to do better every day. There's something about reading about her that to me that both tugs at your heart, but also is hopeful because mm -hmm. she's hopeful. I mean, she's, she's not a dark recovering alcoholic mm -hmm. she's just an honest one <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing is very honest about i felt she was very very honest and a lot of people who have been portrayed as recovering alcoholics are liars they're just lying she's not lying to herself about anything i felt no. like she's so gut honest with herself about i need a meeting or i know this is going to be a problem and also when she's talking to the cop she's like look this is what you're not doing this is what i can do she's very self-confident in what her decisions can be based on there's little trails, we're going to get to that in a second too, of what's happened to her in the past, that there's this underlying mystery under her that you're seeing things about. And readers, if you're still in the beginning of the book, it will get revealed, trust me, but it's, it, and it's going to be a nice surprise because it's not what you're going to think. So also she is going into this Haitian community and she can go in and ask all these questions. So Searching for Angelique brings us into the Haitian community. So tell us a little bit about that and what the experience was writing about. Yes, an underserved population, but a very vibrant population at the same time. So a great deal of my novels have been set in Boston, where I lived for years. I'm now in the mountains of New Hampshire. And, but, you know, Dee Dee Warren was a Boston cop. And I mean, I still adore Boston and go there regularly. And one of the neighborhoods kind of famous slash infamous in Boston is Mattapan. It's one of the highest crime neighborhoods in Boston. So its nickname is Murder Pan. And you'll hear jokes about that in Boston. But it's also known for its really rich cultural heritage with the Haitian community, the Caribbean community. There's a famous parade that happens every year. Um, and that's not to say that's why there's gang, there's violence. There's really a lot of gang issues. And really the police will tell you it's fractured gangs. It's like almost like crazily enough, if there was one overarching dominating gang it would almost be easier but it's organized block by block so it was an interesting neighborhood to research you know talking to the police why is there so much crime and they're like because it's not just a hotbed of gang activity but it's incredibly fractured so block a is now going to take on block b who's going to take on block d so stabbings are a real issue so i'm one of those authors <laughs> if i'm going to write something i need to go there i want to see it i want to walk the streets this is what frankie's doing i feel like I need to do it too. And I had many people tell me I was insane. You do not walk around Mattapan. But for the record, and this is what I love about Frankie, I love about research. I got a friend, I went in daylight hours because in any inner city neighborhood, city smarts, you don't wanna be stupid. But we had the best day. We mm -hmm. met the nicest people. 
Mm -hmm. um, the book features a lot of the, the great Haitian restaurants and where landmarks of Mattapan. Some of these family restaurants, there's no even menu. I mean, they're for locals. The assumption is if you've walked through the door, you already know what you want. I, of course, knew nothing and I can't read Haitian Creole, which is, you know, a version of French. And I mean, they were more than happy. Let us help you. Oh, eat. And then we'd be like, I don't know what I want. What should I eat? And like, oh, eat this, eat that. I mean, we had the best day. And I really do think sometimes, you know, a location can be like a person, like a character in a book itself. You know, it has its flaws, it has its strengths, but it can also fall victim to being stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And my actual experience in Mattapan versus what everyone told me would be my experience in Mattapan, they were dramatically different. I'm glad, I'm really happy I went and I'm madly in love with Haitian food now. <laughs> and it's, it's, come home and say, wait a second, I need to go back there to get more Haitian food. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we ever get done with this pandemic, I'm having more Haitian meat patties. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it's interesting because so many times you're right. People will go in and they know a place. I know what this town is going to be like. I, I went to school in the Bronx. I went to school in the Bronx in the 70s when it was scary. I mean, it was okay. when you used to sit there, uh, the Bronx was on fire. And we had, um, we were in our apartments in at school were very tall buildings. And we used to actually watch the fire trucks going to the fires, like, and mm -hmm. like run bets on who's going to get there first. Really tough neighborhood. And when I was a junior in college, when I first moved, I didn't, I didn't live on campus the first two years I moved there. We were actually living in um, sub, uh, subsidized housing off campus. So picture you take a bunch of kids from Fordham University and put them in subsidized housing with you know the rest of a population. We were across from the Bronx Zoo, but I found it so interesting because living there, I learned so much. I learned so much about people. I learned so much about the, it was this whole experience of you're going to school, but you're living in a community and you were living in this community in the Bronx in the seventies. It was absolutely crazy. And when I think about that and the gate was locked and they would drive us back and forth to campus and things like that. But a lot of times we were just walking because we were mm -hmm. just the Fordham kids. We were going back and forth. And yes, yeah. were you worried at times? Definitely. But it was also where we were living. It was when I was in the laundry room, I was in the laundry room with this, you know, all these kids that lived in the building that were going down, putting their quarters in the machine too. And they were like 10 years old waiting for mom to get home. So that had to be a really interesting experience because you stereotype like, oh, this is what it is. And like, no, go live there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I remember one time I swore my mother's probably listening to this and flipping out. I swore, and this little kid actually spelled the curse word and spelled it wrong. And I go, yeah, that's what I said. I mean, it was really funny. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> he's correcting me and he's going, ah, oh, like this. And I'm like, wow, I'm getting ratted out by an eight-year-old. <laughs> you know, here we go. I'm going to tell my mother. I was like, okay, go tell your mother. It was very funny. Um, you know, Angelique is, what she's involved with is very interesting. And this is really tough, guys, because we're talking about a thriller that I can't give too much away. I can't give away a lot of things that she's going to run into, but it was a really interesting topic that she gets herself wrapped up in. Was that fun to research as well without giving anything away? The real puzzle, and I didn't actually understand this at all until I went to write the book. I'm like, okay, so Frankie is going to investigate missing persons cold cases. So I'm going to say this 15 year old Haitian girl went missing after school and it's now been 11 months later. So then I trot off to interview with the police because especially with a cold case, you need to account for what did happen right after the disappearance because some policing steps have happened, right? So I want to understand what that is. I spent three separate like one hour interviews with the Boston PD. And by the time I was done, I was like, oh crap. It's not clear to me how this girl could have ever gone missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially in a densely populated inner city, which Angelique is living in and looking at the high schools and that kind of things in the area. I mean, there really are cameras everywhere. Uber has cameras, subways have cameras, the T system, which is mass transit in, in Boston has Sam cameras are like, and then there's your cell phone and then there's social media and then there's what we'd find on, you know, it's like, so this girl walks back inside the school. They know that much at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon and is never picked up anywhere on camera ever again. They do find her backpack with her cell phone stashed under a book, uh, a bush, which makes it look like intent, but again, and then she what beamed herself up. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to write like a good two, 300 pages before I even knew how my girl disappeared. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And that was the real irony to me because I kind of took it for granted. Oh, she must have disappeared. And then by the time the police are done with me, I'm like, it's actually not really possible to disappear. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the challenges of the book were different than what I thought they would be when I came up with the concept. <laughs> yeah, because it is these days you can find most people. You can find yeah. most people rather quickly. If you if your child's out, you usually can figure out where they are. You can text somebody, you can track the phone, you can do this. So all those things that she was leaving behind, it was like, whoa, this is really going to be intense of what she's going to do. And then there's something that happens and something else happens. But even what they're involved in is so complex. But so interesting because you could see it happening. You could really yeah, see the that the surveillance system in any urban environment is really impressive. Mm-hmm. I mean, not just cameras for you, but they have like license plate readers. So they're like, 11 months later, we would have rebuilt every single car that had not only been on the street within this window of when she disappeared, but we would have by then contacted every owner, known who had a past record, who was, a, and they're like things like Snapchat, which is like, okay. I'm going to say she's smart enough not to text because teenagers know text can be read, but you know, Snapchat disappears. He's like 11 months later, all of that data is captured. It is captured on servers. And he's like 11 months later, we would have all of it. So some of it might've been like within the first week of the investigation, there's information they're waiting to get, but it was one of the interesting things making a cold case, a major city police department be like 11 months later, the amount of rabbit holes that they've already gone down now and, you know, search warrants, because some of the electronic stuff takes a while. It's not that it can't be done, but it's cumbersome. I mean, the amount of data they would have at their fingertips and that still no sign of this teenager. It actually really was fun. It became almost this urban version of a a closed room mystery Mm -hmm. because that's somewhat what an urban environment becomes. It's its own bubble. Mm -hmm. And how could she have gotten out? <laughs> yeah, how did she get out? How did she disappear? And then what did happen to her along the way? You know, I'm thinking, wait, Snapchat, you can actually find those chats. There are a lot of kids that are watching this. They'll be terrified. It's like, I thought oh, that went away. <laughs> I have a teenage daughter. So she actually was in, we happened to be in New York at this time. And I'm doing a phone interview with a retired superintendent of the Boston police. And she's doing, I think, homework. And I chat with him for an hour. Okay, you'll you'll subpoena texts. You'll get all the um, you know voice messages from the cell phone provider. Blah 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 blah. I'm feeling really good. I hang up the phone. I turn around. My kid's just staring at me, and I'm like, "What?" She's like, "You asked him all the wrong questions." I am an experienced New York Times. <laughs> what do you mean? She's like, "Oh, good God! Every teenager knows that." So you're looking at. <laughs> she like rattled off all these things. I'm like. I'm going to have to call him back now. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I saw that at the end, at your author's note at the end. And I was like, what did her daughter end up telling her? But I just love that she's, she's listening and go, see, mine might've been going like this while I was on the phone. And I would be trying to figure out, does this mean we're supposed to be going out for dinner or am I totally on the wrong track of research? You know, it is fascinating how savvy teens are. I mean, they are the technology generation. I mean, they know way more than you and I ever will and mm-hmm. continue to adapt to it. So she was kind of like, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, and teens live to thwart their parents. This is actually, you know, that's one of those things that's timeless. Yes. But the so use of technology to thwart their parents is kind of like the sweet spot for the teenage years. And once you took that into account, I'm like, okay, now this is getting even more challenging. But when I did follow up with the Boston police, they're like, oh yeah, we know all of that. It takes time, but it all can be retrieved. Well, you know, it's interesting too, because somebody then has to watch that footage. It's not like you're going to come to the exact right minute. Did she leave at 3.20, 2.20? You've got to watch in between. And you always watch the shows on TV where everybody's just standing there staring at the screen all day long, waiting for the car to maybe come by. And I always say I'd like sneeze at that point and miss it. And it'd be like, oh, the whole case is up in the air now still, because I missed what was going on. <laughs> But a great, a, a, you're, um, as a writer now, you're 20 years later in your career, like we're whatever number, we're not going to do the math because then we can figure out where she wrote her first book, folks. We're not doing that today. So when you think about what your challenges were a couple of decades ago compared to now, they're so much bigger as a writer because of what can be found out and what can be tracked that you've got to keep hidden of what we you know, can't do or, or have to undo. It's interesting to me because it's the same learning curve I see in law enforcement. 
Mm -hmm. you know, when I interview with detectives and FBI agents and the like, they're like the toughest part of their career, even for rural police officers, because I've done some books set up where I live in the wilds of New Hampshire with the county sheriff's department. They're like the hardest part of our job is keeping up on technology. Mm -hmm. you have to. You cannot be a Luddite, a Luddite detective because this is how perpetrators are getting away with things. Mm -hmm. Anything a teenager is thinking about using to hit hide messages, you as a detective needs to know. Mm -hmm. um, gaming software is kind of the new go-to way of hiding porn mm -hmm. because they're such huge files that you can, you know, hijack in other, and they're like, we need to know that, you yeah. know, whether we ever want to play Warcraft or not, we need to know this is how things, this has become a very popular way of distributing porn and looking like you're just sharing a gaming file kind of thing. Um, so, and they're like, and we still have our real jobs. So like, you know, we still have 40 hours a week, if not 60 hours a week of actually doing investigative work. And then on our free time, our job is to keep up. And I mean, and let's think about how fast, you know, technology is changing. It really impresses me. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'd have to admit at my age, I don't really love technology. I'd like to, you know, sometimes never see a computer again, but you cannot write a convincing thriller. You cannot create today's reality and not know these things. And not know, and also with your, and we're not going to give anything away, but what happens in your book is a very real thing that can occur. And I had not thought about it, but wow, you talk about a true game. And when people, when you read this, you're going to get what I'm talking about. It's this complete created world of what's going on. And I just found that like, you know, completely interesting because, um, but think about it. When I started the novel, I had no idea how she disappeared and why she disappeared. That really was the writing process for me. So I'm so glad it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it totally did. It totally did. Well, do you also think about if we didn't have Zoom as a technology, which we didn't know what it was last March, and then all of a sudden it was, you and I would not be talking right now. Promoting this book would be how? Like, you know what? Calling people on the phone to do an interview. I mean, seriously, Facebook Live with a, like a, the shaky cam or stuff like that. What would you be doing right now to be able to promote a book? And thinking about the experiences, like you and I haven't seen each other in a couple of years, but to be able to do this and be able to have a conversation, be able to have in-depth conversations as opposed to something on the fly. It's, exactly. But it's okay, what else is going on and what else is happening? Because there are also people that are using communication these days and all technology for things that are far more nefarious than what we're doing, far more. Technology is a tool and some of us use it for good and some of us use it for evil. And my job as a thriller writer is to know both. And I like the fact that I'm blaming being a thriller writer for knowing for the, the evil. Let's just put it that way. That's the only reason I know that stuff. The only reason you've got that stuff. <laughs> you know, when I was thinking back to the, you know, um, the, the uh, HBO special, and it was about really about the DNA and trying to find the DNA. And then what would the DNA That's be able to link to? Cool. And you are thinking of all these little rabbit traces that people have all along the way. The other thing Angelique's got is um, this brother who absolutely is crazy about her and he wants to be part of the investigation. And she actually, you know, like he gets assigned things to do to try to like, you know, help and stuff like that. I just like loving these things, you know? These little moments. One of the things I thought was really important, if you're going to do a missing person, I mean, you need to care. You, the reader, need to care about this 15-year-old girl that, of course, you never met because she exists on paper. And part of that was making her family come alive. So Angelique Fado is 15 years old. She's been in the United States for 10 years. She's one of the Haitians that came in on the temporary protective status after the earthquake in Port-au-Prince. It's her and her younger brother. They're staying with their aunt. This is highly representative of the Haitian community in Boston, one bedroom apartment, three people. I mean, because this is some of the other stuff that Frankie starts to deal with, which how also does a teenager disappear when she has no privacy? Mm -hmm. I mean, Angelique does not have her own computer. They cannot afford that. She and her, her, her brother share. She is sleeping on the sofa, her brother sleeping on the floor. So, you know, she's not disappearing at night because people would kind of recognize that. But she does have a loving family. She mm -hmm. has a younger brother she's incredibly protective of. She has an aunt who just adores her, you know, kind of calls the children the children of her heart, mm -hmm. but her sister's body. And the other thing Frankie recognizes is she gets to know this family better. Because one of the things I think that's interesting about Frankie is she considers her contract to be the missing person. Because often the family is the problem. Mm -hmm. So her first commitment really is to the missing. And if that pisses off the family because she's starting to undercover skeletons right or left, well, so be it. Her contract's with the missing. 
In this case, the family right away, she's kind of like, they really are loving. Mm -hmm. And then Frankie recognizes the younger brother suffering and giving someone something to do is empowering mm -hmm. because it's the helplessness. You know, my sister whom I love has disappeared and there's nothing I can do that is part of his trauma. And that's where, again, Frankie's background, Frankie's own trauma, own brokenness makes her really good with other people because she can recognize their pain and this will actually help you. Like, don't give him platitudes, give him work. That is going to get him to the other side. And it's also going to make him feel like, oh, wow, I can help her. I can do this. Uh, he's empowering this child who's wondering what he's going to say to his mother, wondering, <laughs> feeling for his aunt. He's feeling for everybody. So her recognizing he needs something to do. Yeah, it's a really, really powerful moment. Super, super powerful moment. Uh, you're, uh, Piper the cat is also this very interesting character. Okay, now, has has some memorable scenes, really memorable scenes here. Are you more of a dog person than a cat person, or am I wrong? Actually, I love them both. I've most of my life I've had cats. I end up switching to dogs because my then husband for a while was allergic to cats. Okay. But yes, my neighbors have this cat Piper, and I swear to you, I am a cat person, and this cat hates me has hated me for like three years now. Like all they have to do is walk into the room and the cat hisses at me. And I'm like, really, seriously? Like I brought different kinds of cat treats. I've tried also, yeah. So uh, Piper's for me, cause she loves my neighbors quite a bit is somewhat this feral hostile cat. And I'm like, that's it. You deserve a book. You're like the cat from Pet Cemetery for the love of God. So, <laughs> and I, tell you, I, I think the, the, Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> I just really feel that the cat is really going to miss Frankie because the cat's going to have nobody to be hanging out with anymore. You know, she's going to have some food thrown at her, but it's not the quite thing as nipping at the heels or whatever else she's going to do. Little feral yeah, cat. Again, for the record, Frankie doesn't have money. Mm -hmm. I mean, she doesn't. She goes from town to town and she works as a bartender. So she's very light on cash flow. So she needs some place to live. And it's like, okay, here's this reasonably priced apartment. It comes with a catch. There's a cat involved. She's like, you know, for that price point, what the hell? I mean, and then she starts to understand why that price point. Yeah. But I love the idea because to me, Frankie's a little bit feral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, societal norms, the, the normal social conventions don't really work so well for her either. And Piper's totally feral. So in many ways, they, they fit very nicely together. <laughs> I like when she gets up in the morning, she starts negotiating, putting her feet down. Like, where are you? What are you going to do? You're going to come... <laughs> Now understanding the cat next door, I completely get this. I completely, you know, have got what's going on. You're also very involved with animal rescue. So I was thinking of that as well as you definitely have sympathy towards this cat that would get to stay there and would not be put like into the shelter for being mean. Piper is a rescue from my local humane society, the Conway Area Humane Society. And um, I have my own like circling us as we're speaking right now, my own dog who I rescued. She is four, she was 14 when I adopted her and she's 17 now and doing great. And it just brings so much joy to our lives. I think our, our furry friends. And it gives you companionship when you go hiking and you go places. You can have, yeah. <laughs> you can come with me. A friend the other day said, I really, she was babysitting or dog sitting, not babysitting, dog sitting. And she says, I don't know. I think I'm really tempted. And I wrote and I said, rainy, cold day. See if you're still tempted snowy cold day see if you're still tempted you you have a couple of benchmarks you need to borrow the dog on a couple of other days to see if you really want to make this move because I, you know with the pandemic we're home so much and i watch people walking all day long most of the people on the really cold days have an animal with them they're not just out walking by themselves so it's companionship so for the record this is the joy of a senior pet because ruby my senior rescue would tell you rainy cold day rainy snowy day sofa fire Sofa fire, sofa fire. <laughs> this is perfect. This is the perfect pet. This is the perfect pet. Light that fire. Light that fire. You know, woven into the story of Frankie is this backstory about her life that we just get little bits of along the way. Someone named Paul, references to him come up again and again. Were they there from the start or is that backstory of her something you added along the way? That's something I'm always like curious about. It's interesting to me, uh, character development to me is organic. And, and that is to say, I knew Paul, but I didn't know what had happened with Paul. But I just, I feel like this is when you start sounding like the, the crazy person in the room, but this is the only way I can describe the art of what I do. I mean, the research and the plot to me is kind of the technique 
And that's the hardcore working on it. Frankie from the very beginning was this voice I heard. And she clearly had this great love, Paul, and something went wrong. It just didn't work out for her. And she feels a lot of guilt about that. And some of it's just kind of this guilt that he loved her so much and she just couldn't do normal life. Like, you know, his vision of their future was just too normal. Mm -hmm. and as much as she loved him, Frankie didn't know how to do normal. But everything else, it just kind of developed and happened. But no, I, there was no planning involved. <laughs> you know, I'm always trying to figure out what the plot is there at the front and how much comes in later. But you really write organically. Like you're just, you start feeling that character and the character unfolds in front of you. It's a giant hot mess. And then there's a lot of revision work at the end to make it all like actually look like it fit together versus the Frankensteinian <laughs> that I started with. Your writing process is your writing process. I mean, some people like to plot. Some people, we, I'm called a pantser, like writing by the seat of my pants. And your process is your process. So can you turn it off? Okay, it's time to eat dinner. It's time to go cook dinner for your daughter. It's time to pick your daughter up in those years that we were driving people around. Can you just stop or does your head keep going while you're sitting at the traffic light of what's going on with Frankie? Do you turn Frankie off or keep it going? If I've closed out a scene and things feel temporarily resolved, the resolve for that chapter, I can switch gears. If I don't like what I wrote, if I'm mid-scene and it's going poorly, but now I have to stop and do dinner, uh, the family will tell you I'm not terribly present. Mm -hmm. Like I physically show up, but clearly my brain is still typing away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I interviewed Cassandra uh, Conroy this weekend, Cassandra Kane Conroy, and she was talking about how she and Pat Conroy living together, what that was like, because they both would show up to dinner and they both have the other characters in their head as well. And she's, if you're a writer, it really helps that you understand what the other yeah. person is doing when, I, I would say they continue to like peel the potato and the potato is now down to like a French fry because yeah. they're just like, okay, this is what's going on. And if somebody doesn't understand living inside your head, I think it's very difficult to say like, oh wait, she's making salad, but she's also doing what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Just moving on with this. So usually you've said it's three months of research, six months to write, three months to move it all around and reconstruct and re yes. rethink. Is that still what the schedule is? Pretty much, yeah. And pretty every January to beginning of February, the new novel comes out. So this time next year, We'll have the second Frankie book. Wow. So when you're doing this, like what part are you at right now on the next book? Are you? So I've completed the research and I'm starting the writing. Oh, so wow. Between you and me and don't tell anyone I've done, the writing part's not going well yet, but it will. At any time now, it's going to just click. <laughs> this is just a very strange year to try. And I mean, I get up in the morning and there's certain things I plan to do and then other things get in the way. And it's just that okay, I have to go do this. And then all of a sudden I do have 3 a.m. nights where I just pour through things and get them done. And I think that's because you don't have to get up at 6.30 to get, you know, drive into the city and do things like that. But yeah, I think a lot of people said the writing or the, the parts of it are not going exactly the way they will, but it's going to get fixed soon, you know? All authors talk about attention span is harder now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and it's, it's kind of that crazy thing too, where give a busy person work and they'll get it done. Mm -hmm. the faster paced life. I mean, so myself as a novelist, like a lot of New York Times bestselling novelists, I used to travel a third of the year. Mm -hmm. I have writing friends who travel half of the year. It also meant then that when you were home, you had to be productive because you were like in two weeks, three weeks about to be gone again. Mm -hmm. Now that we have all this time on our hands, it's like, we can't get anything productive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe you should just pack the suitcase, put it in the car, <laughs> like Practice, like practice for leaving the house again. Because, you know, it is really funny because I realize how much more time I have just because there's certain things. It's like I can sit at my desk and start working with wet hair, which you can't do when you're sitting in your New York office. You just can't yeah. be doing these things. So it's just things that like save time because you can just sit down and just start working and then deal with things later on. And I don't know, I just think we, we're still on like, what is it going to be? And then it's going to shift again. And then how do we get shifted as we do need to be other places? Like right now, there are not a lot of places you need to be. You need to be, so you should be able to work a lot. And then you're just like, but why can't I? What's going on? You know? So you have a kill a friend, maim a buddy sweepstakes on your site. And I want to know more about this. What is this? 
So this is a really fun contest. And I really mean it's for fun, but it's kind of macabre too, where if you go to lisagardner.com, you can enter to win the Kill a Friend Mama Buddy sweepstakes or the Kill a Friend Mama Mate if you're international. Um, and it is to nominate the person of your choice to die in the next novel. I have to tell you, it's competitive. So there are two winners before she disappeared, the international and the national. For the U.S. side, um, you're only allowed to enter once under your email, but other people can certainly nominate you. So the winner of this year's book was nominated 36 times. Whoa. Whoa. So there's either that many people who love her and wanted to help her gain literary immortality, or there's that many people who wanted her dead. I'm going with the optimistic point of view, but <laughs> but it's really, it's meant to be just fun and kind of, you know, I joke, you know, the gift of the person who has everything, literary mortality as a lucky stiff. <laughs> and how do they win? You look at the story and you say, or well, is this random? Random. It's random. So, I mean, thousands and thousands of people have entered. So, I mean, you go onto the website, you fill out the little form. It's not much at all. Basically your email address. And they all go into a pot and I think we dump them into an Excel spreadsheet and then we use a random number integer for numbers one through 3000, give me the winning number and whoever that line is, hey, you just won. But that one person came up a number of times when you go back and look at the spreadsheet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Their name was there a lot. Okay, there you go. Was this always the title of the book? No. Um, I can't even remember what the original title is. We title them kind of later in the game and I'm not good at titling. So just a joke. So this is before she disappeared. It's the first Frankie Elkin book. So I'm now working on book two, which at the moment I've titled, then he was gone too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And it makes me understand now why the word she, I don't know if I can see this, she is so much bigger because the next is going to be he. All we have to do is take out the S and you're like, we can just keep going folks. But no, I noticed that. I, I love the cover. I love the cover, not just because it's one of my favorite colors, but um, I, I was joking that I painted the wall behind to match the book, which everyone who knows me well knows that's just a joke. But I really love the cover because you've got this, if you really are looking, you just see the title and then you start looking at the image behind and start playing with that. And you see, it's like very, very mysterious. You yes. it's not that It's not just an eye or a hand or something. It's a swirl. I'm saying swirl. Am I right? It's a, it's a woman drowning really, which has to do with the first chapter of the book. Oh, okay. So I like to joke before she disappeared, when in the time when you're all done reading the book, who is she? Ah, very good. Ooh, now going in many different directions on that. Gee, we need to revisit this in a year when we actually can talk about what happened. <laughs> so, I also gave the audiobook a uh, little bit of a listen with Hillary Huber doing the narration. Did you have you listened to the audio? Have you gotten a chance to do that? I have not yet. I haven't received it yet. Okay. I mean, one of the things going on right now in publishing is every like I just finally got the hardcover book like a, like a week ago which is wow. the latest I've ever gotten it. Normally by now I've received the audio. Again, between manufacturing and shipping, everything's happening so late. Wait. I was listening online. I did not have a physical copy. I was just listening to like a digital sample to see what was going on. Do you select your narrator or does- is No, that I work with, a, I mean, Brilliance Publishing on it and they generally send me like three finalists. And, but in this case, um, her background and what she had, I mean, she was just such a perfect fit. It was book. perfect fit. It's it's definitely, you know, just nailing the, the voice. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the next Frankie. I am laughing because it's like the standalone after all these years. And it's like, okay, folks, it's actually the first in a series, but <laughs> well, pretend it's a standalone for the next year. Let's just let Lisa think she wrote a standalone and we'll make Thank that you. feel better Thank about you. that. I'm going with that. <laughs> Does that really sound good? Or does that sound good. Do you have a lot of virtual events set up for the next couple of weeks? It'll be really fun this week. Tonight I talk to, so tonight's Tuesday, January 19th, and I get to talk to Riley Sager for Poison fun. Pen. Fun. Thursday night, I'm with Lee Child for the Cuyahoga County Library System. And then Friday night is Lisa Scottolini. Oh, how fun. So I have to say, if one thing about the pandemic is authors now just get together and get to chat for the sake of our readers, I, there, there are greater hardships out there. <laughs> there are greater hardships. And also you get to hang out. Like it, it, when you sit and start talking, it's like they're talking at the bar. In fact, they yes. should just have a cocktail in their hand, except maybe because of Frankie, no drinks. You know what I mean? Maybe well, no I drinks. Tell you, suspense novelists I find are the most collegial. Like, I, I mean, I joke. I, I mean, all of us joke. We, we must get rid of our antagonism and violence writing in the page. Because I mean, we are who you want to hang out with. 
mean, mm-hmm. we're pretty darn chill at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're at a conference today, I can relax now at the bar. <laughs> if you're at a conference, it's like across the room, so and so, so and so all the time. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because so many um, other authors are more, uh, I don't know, they, it's like you're getting ahead or I'm getting ahead. This is where I think people really cheer each other. Competitive. Again, the thriller writers, and I, I, I just, we get out our aggressions during the day. We're pretty chill. <laughs> yeah. And how you help other people as well. How you help other authors, young authors coming up through the ranks, be it, you know, doing panels or conversations. I just find it, it's really one of the most collegial communities and I can just picture you all now zooming away because you don't have to be any place. You don't have to go anywhere. You know, it's just perfect. I'm still doing a lot of things on behalf of the international thriller writers. If you're a suspense novelist or an aspiring suspense novelist, please absolutely check them out. Amazing resources, an amazing group. Did you do anything for their winter chills for that the program? I didn't doing? this time around because I was so busy already with these events. I couldn't cycle in the winter chills as well, but we are now putting together Thriller Fest this summer. Um, I am chair and I am working with the debut author program, which is oh, one of wow. my favorite programs, Thriller Writers, where we do so much resources for debut published authors to try to help them and teach them the business, the networking, help them shine, promote their books, because selling is kind of feels like the Cinderella moment, but actually publishing your first novel in this day and age, it, it's tough and intense. And I, I think any guidance you can get, any opportunities to promote it's all good. And I, I'm really excited to be part of that program. Yeah, they actually taped me for one of the winter chill segments on how to market yourself and what to do. Okay. I was on a panel. And it was really interesting because I'm seeing it from my perspective of what I'm expecting to have an author have on their website or what I mean, to be able to go out and find out as much as I was able to on your website is so helpful. Because if you're going to have a conversation, you don't want to be digging for the information as well. That's got to be no mystery. That's got to be yeah. no thrill. That's got to be right there. So, well, I look forward to seeing you in the future someplace, somewhere. <laughs> I don't know when, <laughs> but this was really great. And I'm just so thrilled about the book. I remember everyone, we're just going to repeat after me. It's a standalone for the next year. So let's just make sure that we definitely let Lisa believe that that's what she wrote. Look Thank forward- you so very much, Carol. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us. And to our readers, look forward to next time. Thank you. Bye.